Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO, Eric Koslick. This time around, I pull up a seat to chat with Andy Keller, head distiller for Blackwater Distilling, Maryland's oldest currently operating craft distillery. We examine one of the really unique and ambitious projects they began just a couple years ago, aging some of their product in a Solera system. Now, what does that mean and why should you care? Well, before we dive into all that, I think I need to pump the brakes just a bit so that you can make yourself a drink. This week's featured cocktail is the Hemingway Daiquiri. You know the daiquiri, right? Rum, lime, simple syrup, shake it all up, delicious. Well, the Hemingway Daiquiri is a riff on this classic that's a bit more complex. And yes, it was developed for Ernest Hemingway himself at La Floridita Bar in Cuba. And legend has it, he always ordered a double. To make it, you'll need one and a half ounces of white rum, three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime juice, one quarter ounce of fresh grapefruit juice, and a quarter ounce of maraschino liqueur. You're gonna combine all those ingredients in a cocktail shaker with ice, give it a good hard shake until it is thoroughly chilled and mixed, then strain into a coupe glass and enjoy. For me, this cocktail can skew a little bit sour depending on the nature and quality of your citrus juice. So because the maraschino is taking the place of simple syrup here, if you need to up it to a third or a half an ounce to make the drink really taste good to you, I'm not gonna tell. Like the classic daiquiri, the Hemingway daiquiri can really teach you a lot about the rum you're drinking and how it plays with other flavors. So use it as a lens through which to view the various bottles on your bar. Just don't start slamming back doubles like Ernest Hemingway and blame me for your hangover. Getting back to the interview at hand, some of the things I discuss with Andy Keller of Blackwater Distilling include what a Solera is and how it's used to add both consistency and complexity to a spirit, a tasting of Blackwater's flagship products, including the first batch of their Solera aged rum, how the Solera is organized and managed, including barrel sourcing, aging time, and blending specs. A vertical tasting from all five levels of the Blackwater Distilling Rum Solera. And this is where we really uncover some of the surprising differences between different levels and barrel finishes. Some interesting thoughts on yeast strains and fermentation styles. What to drink if you run into Russian novelists Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. And much, much more. This was a really fun interview, and if you enjoy some of the episodes where we taste through a number of spirits and offer tasting notes, I think you'll really enjoy it. One quick thing to add, if you're interested in learning more about the Solera from the sherry side of things, which is where it's really been perfected over the centuries, be sure to check out my interview with Chantal Seng, which we'll link to in the show notes. And now, I'm pleased to present this innovative, truly vertical tasting and Solera crash course with Andy Keller of Blackwater Distilling Company. Andy, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Can you introduce yourself for our listeners and uh, give everyone your background so that we know uh, how we came to be here today? <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is Andy Keller. I'm the head distiller at Blackwater Distilling. Um, we are located on Kent Island right across the Bay Bridge, uh, so about an hour from, from D.C., hour from Baltimore. I've uh, been around since, uh, came out with our first product in April 2011, so we're actually uh, the oldest distillery in Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, started making vodka. We now make a line of, of rums and a little bit of whiskey as well. Um, so in terms of my background, I'm mostly, mostly self-taught, kind of got into this business uh, from a love of booze and uh, 
you know, some idea that maybe I could make it cheaper myself. It was sort of how I got into it. Um, but, uh, started out in wine at a winery in Napa Valley after school. Um, some friends and I moved out there, worked in wine for a little while. I had, uh, minored in Chinese in school. So I wanted to kind of take Napa Valley wine to China it was sort of the, the goal of that. And, um, so after working in the winery, I moved to Beijing to try to do that. Um, and uh just never quite got around to it yeah the, uh, <laughs> the beer was cheap and uh it, you know kind of got into some more studying of the language and then got a real job out there at uh, at a public relations company and then uh, eventually moved back to the u.s to get married and um, started home brewing beer really wanted to start a brewery for a while looked around and saw 4,000 breweries and didn't seem like we needed another one right uh, <laughs> turned out we needed like two or three thousand more but uh Bottle. I read some article, I think, in The Economist or something about craft distilling in, in the UK and said, I, I didn't know you could do that. So started reading into it and bought myself a little still and, and taught myself how to make gin and whiskey and, and that sort of thing. Read as many books as I could get my hands on. And uh, I wanted to start a distillery. I was going around all the other distilleries in the area. There really weren't many at that time. So um, there was Catoctin Creek and uh, Copper Fox in Virginia. Uh, New Columbia Green Hat had just gotten started in D.C., and then Blackwater was in Maryland. So going right. around, talking to the founders about how they started up, and Blackwater just really seemed like there was some some synergy there. Um, they really needed some some on-site labor, <laughs> and uh, I really needed you know all the licenses and everything, and it sort of made sense to skip you know, a lot of the startup process from my end and just walk into a place that had all the licenses, use some of the money I had raised to bring in some new equipment and, and get started on some new things. So that's kind of how I got into this. Got it. So Blackwater was kind of getting started and then you showed up and said, Hey, I know how to distill. <laughs> you guys need a distiller yep. and some equipment. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. And I don't think I'd, I knew that about you about China. I think I knew something about the wine background. But I didn't <laughs> realize you'd spend time in China. That's fascinating. Yeah, I was there for about five years total. Wow. Okay. So fast forward a little bit. And now we have a number of lovely spirits in front of us. We have today both a lineup of bottles, which we're going to taste a couple of, but then we have another intriguing lineup of much smaller bottles that are very, very special. Uh, and the topic of today's interview, it's, it's kind of all orbiting around the idea of this thing that we call a Solera. So why don't I let you um, tell folks what a Solera is and why what you're doing with your Solera here is so special. And then we can turn our attention back to the products and kind of taste our way through that and, and try to understand it through flavor. Sure. Uh, so Solera aging, uh, it's, it's a Spanish term, and they, they use Solera aging for making cherry in Spain. Um, and I guess really it's an architectural term, which sort of means foundation. Um, but in terms of an aging and blending process, what it really comes down to is the barrels never get fully emptied. So you can think of the simplest of Solera as just a single barrel. Uh, so when you bottle, you pull less than half of it out of there instead of the entire emptying the entire thing, fill that up with new stuff, and then let it continue to, to age for, for an, some amount of time before you pull from it again. Um, so that would be the, the simplest Solera. Uh, and then you can get a lot more complicated, multiple, multiple barrels in a level and multiple levels. Uh, so what we've done is, uh, on the grand scheme of things, a pretty small Solera in terms of the number of barrels in it. Uh, but it's pretty aggressive in terms of like the complexity of it and the number of levels. So, right. uh, we've got a five level Solera, um, where the, the bottom level is where we're bottling from. It's five levels of five fifty three gallon barrels, uh, well, 53 to 59 gallon barrels, um, and we bottle just out of the bottom level. Every six months, we'll pull uh, less than half out of each of those barrels on the bottom level, blend that together, and then uh, that gets diluted down and goes into the bottle. And then rather than refilling that empty space with new rum, we're taking rum out of the next level of barrels above it. Um, and then that's getting refilled with rum from the next level all the way up to the top. So the very top level there is where the, the brand new rum out of the still is going. So uh, the way we're running this, uh, what that really means, it's going to take get three years of aging before anything new from the still shows up in the bottle for the first time. So we get a, a minimum of three years in the blend. And then... Um, because we're leaving so much of it behind in each level on the way down, by the time that three year shows up, it's actually less than 1% of what's in the bottle. 
Um, so the, the advantage of it, we get a lot of complexity from the blend of different vintages that end up in the bottle. Um, we can blend in different barrels, uh, new oak, used oak, barrels that have been used previously for wines or uh, dessert wines and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, we also get a lot of consistency because any changes we make are going to happen slowly over time um, rather than a big jolt from, from batch to batch. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Do you have any, um, like you were mentioning, like the dessert wine finished barrels, do you have a, um, any, any either like, like new chard oak or do you have any like dessert finish casks in there? Yeah. So, um, we didn't, uh, you know, start out making rum with the idea of a Solera in mind. So when we set up the Solera, what we did was incorporate a lot of barrels that we already had on hand and already filled. Um, so those were mostly new charred oak barrels that went into that. Uh, and then we've also got, I've got used bourbon barrels. I've got used rye barrels in there. Um, if you look up at the very top, um, you can see some different size barrels. So we've got some French oak in there in addition to the American oak, uh, two used port barrels and one used, uh, red wine barrel from black ankle winery up in uh, Westminster. Okay. Uh, wow. That is, a, that, that is a lot of complexity. Um, I, I do think that one of the advantages of the, the Solera system is that it kind of, it kind of pulls in two different directions, right? It pulls in the direction of complexity because you have the opportunity to add these different types of barrels. And yet, as you mentioned, this is all being taken in by the sum of all this rum, right? It's the the change. If you add a new barrel in there, that that change is being distributed throughout the fractional blending system, mm -hmm. right? That's what that's what in my in my mind when I when I think Solera, I think fractional blending, meaning that you're taking a fraction of what's um, in a barrel, emptying that out into a bottle, and then fractionally adding in more stuff from what came, I guess, above it. Um, I guess my my next question about Solera. Um, setups, I guess, is it seems like the the elevation and the tiers of the Solera are kind of intentional. So is there a reason why the new make spirit should go at the top of the Solera and everything should move down? Or is that just the way you've decided to do it? It's sort of just the way we've decided to do it. Um, I've never been to one of the big uh, sherry bodegas and see how a, a, an operation at scale does this sort of thing. Um, so for us, uh, we've got everything set up on barrel racks that uh, get taken down with the forklift. So in general, they just get stacked. Uh, there's no there's no literal connection going from barrel to barrel where I'm doing it with gravity and, and simply emptying in there. So it's actually a little more complex than it sounds. So when we bottle, uh, basically that whole stack gets taken apart. Um, I take the, the five barrels from the bottom level, empty them all out into a container, blend them together, pull off what I'm going to be bottling, and then redistribute that back into those barrels and take the next level down, empty it all out. So uh, each, each level actually gets all blended together as well. Um, so once it goes back into the barrel, you've got a, a, a really homogenous blend of, of all those other barrels as well. Um, that's, it's a ton of labor. So it, it's, there's a lot of that built into the, you know, this is kind of our flagship, um, aged rum product. Uh, so it's our, our priciest bottle. It takes me about two or three days of just straight labor to, to get a few hundred bottles every six months that we do. <laughs> right. Right. No, it's not surprising based on what you're describing. Um, so we're going to have some, some photos of this Solera on the show notes page and, uh, what a number of folks might immediately think of when they see this picture is like it, like a bourbon rickhouse, for example, because stacking is very important. Uh, and a lot of these facilities, what they're playing on is the different thermoclines and, and right. differences in heat. But we're in a completely climate controlled facility right now. Well, it's it's not climate controlled. Um, we uh, it's not open like the big bourbon rickhouses. You know, they they are intentionally built out of thin materials so you get large swings in in temperature and and that sort of thing so we're in a, a business park right here so we've got con um, cinder block walls um, we get temperatures ranging from like the high 40s in the winter up to you know 
mid 90s high 90s in the summer in here so we do get some variation and it, it will be cooler down at the bottom here than at the top but at, at the end of the day this isn't a seven story rick house it's just five levels of barrels so sure. it's hard to say how much the the climate really plays into okay okay so on in here so there is a little bit of climate influence then um and obviously uh, people know heat rises and therefore you know w- what's going to be happening at the top of the solera closer to the ceiling is going to be a little bit different um oak is a porous material and as changes in temperature take place the pores in that oak open and close and that gives uh, the liquid access to certain characteristics of the char or whatever was left in the barrel before it was used for this particular purpose so a little bit of uh, a little bit of play in temperature and i would expect that uh, in um the sherry producing regions of spain that all that's also the case i'm, mm-hmm. I'm sure that's the case and it's it's interesting to me. I, I think it, it's actually kind of a good move to have the barrels that you bottle from on the bottom because to me, uh, it seems like that gives it the most chance to kind of like integrate with itself. You hear of spirits out there like... Uh, the best example I can think of off the top of my head is chartreuse where it's aged, but it's, it's aged intentionally in a way where it's, it's not there to get as much influence from the barrel as it is to get kind of like integrated within itself. So it seems Mm -hmm. like having those on the bottom where there's going to be a lower temperature swing might be good for that. Incidentally, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. And the, the top of the stack is where if in the future, like I said, this all started out with kind of new oak, but in the future when we're blending in a, a barrel or two of new oak, that'll happen at the very top. Um, because we want that brand new spirit to get hit with fresh char. Um, and those barrels are getting the most influence from the, the temperature. So it's really moving in and out of those, uh, out of the wood, um, in that fresh char. So that'll all happen at the top of the stack. Mm-hmm. So when you bottle these, um, are you bottling half of each of the bottom barrels or is there a specific percentage that you go for? Yeah. So, um, Basically, the percentage and the uh, the percentage that you're bottling from the barrel and the um, frequency of bottling are the two things two things that really create the kind of uh, trade secret of any Solera aged rum. So um, I we bottle every six months, so that's that's the goal. Um, but the percentage that we pull out, we don't disclose. Okay. Um, but it's less than half. Um, the the less you pull out each time and the the less frequently you bottle the kind of higher the average age of the of what's in the bottle will end up being um so the way we're doing it we'll we'll end up with an average age somewhere around seven years in the bottle over time Mm -hmm. so um we're just getting started with this so it's kind of early days it's about four and a half years in the bottle right now average age uh, but over the next decade that'll just very gradually creep up you know adding a quarter of a year or so each time to until we get to about seven years right and so you say until we get to seven years uh it does something change at that point not really it just kind of all gets into equilibrium um and then that's really when the consistency will will kick in i guess so uh, when you start up a solera um normally you would you would fill the bottom level year one you would fill a level above that in year two level above that in year three so the the setup that we've done would traditionally take five years to get going um we needed to shortcut that Uh, i already had some barrels aging for a little over two years when we started the Solera up. Um, but what we did was actually bring in some some older rum from Jamaica, uh, which is one of my favorite rum producing uh, flavor profiles. And um, we blended that rum with our rum to sort of create average ages in these tiers um, that, that would approximate setting it up uh, all from scratch in-house. Um, and through the nature of the Solera aging system, um, again, this first decade is going to be a lot of changes for a product that really it traditionally would be very consistent, um, but it will very gradually transition over from uh, still a majority of our rum in the first batch uh, and a minority of the Jamaican rum, but very gradually transition over to 100% our rum mm-hmm. over time. Um, it, the neat thing about the Solera, you never know if any, you know, what the oldest in there is. So, you know, 50 years down the road, there still could be molecules of that original um, Jamaican rum in our blend, but. Uh, it should fairly seamlessly transition over to our realm. Yeah, and it's kind of like blockchain for booze in that respect, right? It's <laughs> yeah. every, everything links back to the original pour that that went into that barrel, mm-hmm. which is so cool. It means that there's all there's never quite 
you never quite get to the point where you've taken all of that first batch out, which is, uh, it's, it reminds me of like the, the Zeno's paradox of motion where it's like, you know, uh, motion becomes, uh, like it's, it's Achilles racing the tortoise. And before Achilles, you know, gets halfway to the tortoise or something, he's got to get halfway there and halfway there. Right. So it's a <laughs> rid- ridiculous paradox. Everyone should look it up. Uh, but okay. So what we're going to do here is we've, we've actually pulled, um, product from each of these uh, five tiers and we have it sitting here. Uh, But first, uh, before we get into that, I think it would also really help for listeners to understand kind of like the story of Blackwater, kind of what your products uh, are all about, and then maybe some of the backstory about, you know, Kent Narrows here and and the historical significance of where we are. Yeah, we've been uh, we've been making rum for guess coming up about five years now um and the rums are called picaroon which is an old word for rogue or scoundrel so on we we've kind of gone through a, a branding evolution here so um on the table we've got our original bottles here which which kind of have this uh sort of piratey look to them um and uh when we were trying to come up with a brand for the rums we we landed on picaroon um uh, old word that meant rogue or scoundrel so it had that kind of piratey connotation to it without having to put a pirate on the bottle and <laughs> right yeah they're too piratey about the whole thing yeah there's obvious uh obvious branding things going on with pirates <laughs> on bottles yep uh so if if you look on the on the bottle uh, through the bottle onto the back label there's actually a little wanted poster on the inside there oh, for yeah. the for the picaroons of ken island where we're located so oh, i love it back in the early 1600s uh this area was uh just a trading post it was owned by one family and uh, when it came down to it, they sort of considered themselves to be Virginians rather than uh, Marylanders. So um, when the king sort of laid out the, the land for the colony of Maryland and said, um, you're going to be part of Maryland, these guys put up a fight about it. And uh, there were some, some little British on British uh, battles in some of the local creeks around here. So uh, that's sort of the, the story behind the, the Picaroon name there. Um, in terms of uh, what we're trying to accomplish with the rum, so we start um, when we when we started working on the rum, we started with trying out basically every sugar we could get our hands on. So rum is made out of sugar cane or its byproducts uh, like molasses, black, blackstrap molasses. So we tried everything from the raw stuff we could get uh, all down through the various grades of molasses, organic versions of each of those, um, fermented and, and distilled those under as much of the same conditions as we could, uh, and then sat down one morning and tasted through sixteen different rums in a, in a blind taste test and, and landed on, uh, what was essentially the rawest sugar, uh, in the bunch. So, uh, it's called a golden cane syrup. Uh, it's basically the juice pressed out of the cane, plant fibers filtered out, uh, most of the water's boiled off and then we get a thick syrup. So that comes to us from a sugar company in Georgia and it's, it, it's, really really tasty stuff just all by itself um if you're used to black strap molasses rums it's a very different flavor profile from that um we get a much lighter flavor out of it basically black strap is sort of what's left over at the very end of the sugar refining process so right. most of the actual sugars have been removed and then what's left at the end is all these vitamins and minerals and and really um, you know all the flavors there at the end so it's an extremely concentrated uh flavor um, whereas this kind of incorporates everything. So we get, um, we get, we get a lot more actual sugar in the mix. Um, so it's easier to ferment than blackstrap, which, which makes it fun to work with. Um, uh, and then we get this nice light flavor, especially when we were considering starting out with unaged rums. Uh, we wanted something that would be very approachable, uh, without having to put it in a barrel for, for years and years. For sure. Uh, so yeah, we get, uh, on our, on our white rum, which we're tasting now, um, well, you can tell me what you think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I love this. Uh, it, it's great to hear you talk about the base that you use because I get a lot of that kind of light, more agricultural flavor as opposed to that heavy, like almost like burnt black strap thing that you're getting that's that's way, way more processed. Um, I get really nice at first, right when I poured it out of the bottle, I got more like banana and vanilla. And then as, as it, as it airs out a little bit, you get a really nice butterscotch and almost a hint of like, I want to say like a, like a cooked pineapple or something like that. 
So you get a little bit more of the the fruity fruity notes as as it as it opens up, and uh, like banana is an interesting note in rum because it, it's obviously a fruity note, but it's almost like more of a bready note in a mm. rum sometimes, uh, which makes banana a very weird weird flavor. And you can go <laughs> like you could call it a ripe banana, or you could call it like a green banana, or like a plantain almost. Right. And I'm getting a lot of that in here, so that's really cool. Yeah, and a lot of that is coming down to to the yeast. So I, I think a lot of those kind of creamy vanilla flavors uh, are are tying and butterscotch. That's probably tying back to the sugar. And then um, so we also I think we went through six different yeast strains that we we tried out in our original testing, um, and landed on one that's isolated from natural sugarcane fermentations. Um, so it's it's you know kind of evolved to to eat this type of sugar and process this type of sugar, uh, puts off some really nice, uh, you know, classic rum aromas like mm-hmm. bananas and, and pineapples and, and that sort of thing. It's on the palate. It's, it's very, um, it's, it's nice and it's warming, which is, I think some, sometimes, um, when, when I come up against a rum, like one of my actual criticisms is that it, I don't feel it. And I feel like a lot of rums that you taste from the Caribbean are meant to be deliberately warming. Like it's like you feel it not just in your mouth, but a little bit in your chest as well. And to me, that's actually one of the hallmarks of a good white rum. Mm. Um, so I'm glad that I'm getting that. And then you get some really nice biscuity notes on this too, on the palate, which is a really nice play off the fruity notes on the nose. I think, I think it's really nice and nice and integrated. Uh, it's a complex flavor profile. So great job on the white rum for Thank sure. You. For sure. Okay. So can you, while I finish up this sample here, can you tell folks about the other products that you offer? And then what we'll do is, so basically this is what goes into those top barrels, correct? Sort of. Um, so we use all the same sugar source. So, uh, that's constant across everything we do, um, so far. Uh, but in terms of yeast fermentation, fermentation styles, distillation styles, we've got uh, a lot of variability between our products. Okay. So um, what we're tasting right now, uh, the white rum is is meant to be sort of a mojito daiquiri rum. Um, so we wanted it to be super clean, um, very approachable right off the bat. So um, we ferment and distill with that in mind so we try to try to make a really pure product with the still at the same time we don't want to make it so pure that we've turned it into vodka which is where a lot of like the big brand white rums kind of fall uh, is basically just under that line that allows you to call it rum um, so basically if you distill it to 94 and a half percent alcohol it's rum distill it to 95 percent alcohol you've made a sugarcane based vodka so we 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 take it well below that um, mm-hmm. to, to get a little more character in there but distill it to still a high enough purity that you can you can drink it um unaged and just put on the rocks if that's the way you want to drink a white rum which is not the way most white rum is drunk but true that's that's our goal with everything uh so we make our white rum that way uh it it also gets a light carbon filtration just uh, to smooth it out a little bit um when we do that it actually we get a lot more of that kind of creamy sort of marshmallow almost flavor coming out of it from that right um, so that's our white rum. We do an overproof white rum that we're sold out of right now. It's, it's, uh, very popular, especially among people who come from the Caribbean, um, because, uh, there are all these overproof white rums down there. Uh, they're intensely flavorful. Um, so we, we bottle that at 120 proof, 60% alcohol. It does not get carbon filtered. So it's essentially the unfiltered version of our, um, regular white rum, um, standard proof white rum. We do a gold rum, which is our white rum with uh, a little bit of caramelized sugar added to it. So we make that caramelized sugar in house. It's a very small amount. It gives it the gold color. It really turns those kind of fresh bananas and pineapples in the white rum into like caramelized bananas and pineapples on on the nose and flavor sure and then our dark rum was our first aged rum so it's sort of a blend of our barrel aged rum uh, that we do in brand new charred oak for between a year and a half and two years Uh, with some of our white rum uh, we use a a small amount of kind of an intensely aromatic um, rum from the french west indies to give it a a nice top note and uh, and then a little bit of that same caramelized sugar yeah. So that one we've actually gotten best in category for aged rum two years in a row at the American Distilling Institute competition. So hey, it nice. seems to work. Yeah. <laughs> I I may have I may have judged this <laughs> in, in January. That's fantastic. Um you can definitely see that like new chart oak on there. Like mm-hmm. that's like the first thing I see when I look at it is it, it's got that that really beautiful brown color. Um wow, that's um 
that's actually I, I would if if you've got yeah, some absolutely. awards on this, I, think we, <laughs> I wasn't planning to. I was planning to skip straight to the Solera, which is the star <laughs> of the episode here. But uh, you know, you can't really you can't skip the medals. Yes, yeah, so this is uh, this is definitely one of my favorites of the of all the products we make is the dark rum. Beautiful. So we oh, use yeah. we use brand new charred oak, so it, we get a lot of that kind of caramel and vanilla sort of notes that, that are really classic in American whiskey. So they're kind of surprising to people um, that are not used to that in rum. Um, and then that uh, that little bit of caramelized sugar really really adds some toasty sweetness to it as well. Yeah, and you can definitely like I wouldn't I wouldn't call this like a high ester rum, but it's an ester generous rum. Mm-hmm. Like it's. Uh, I'm getting I'm getting a lot of very similar notes to what we get in in the white rum, but you you're right you get that man it's it's just super it's complex. Sometimes when I, I taste a rum, um, what I'll get on the nose is like a couple of a couple of very distinctive notes, and then when I um, test it on the palate, it'll it'll have this quality that I refer to as it won't sit still, like it's constantly evolving. But rarely do I come across that where it's opposite. And what I'm getting here on the nose is it, it's kind of not sitting still for me on the nose. It's got like a lot of what I got from the the Picaroon White Rum, but it's also got a bunch of sp- like it's got some soft spice in the background. Like I'm like um, I'm getting some clove and, and a little bit of allspice in the mm-hmm. background. Um, that's really that's really intriguing. Yeah. Oh man, on the palate, <laughs> it's so like it, you get that that bourbon that that bourbon influence mm-hmm. like for sure or not obviously this wasn't ex bourbon it was new new new, new oak. charred oak but you never really get to taste that outside of bourbon or, or rye whiskey from america because pretty much everything else in the world is put into a used barrel of some some sort in terms of spirits exactly so that really does i think make it unique um wow okay um so what are the other really quickly the other products that you do uh before we get to the solera yep so the uh we do a single barrel rum uh, where all the bottles come from one barrel, um, that is going to be the most inconsistent product that we do um, because uh, each barrel, I, I'm kind of using that as a, a little playground. Each barrel is very different. So the one we have right now is is two and a half years from a, a used bourbon barrel. Um, we've got some some other fun stuff coming up with that. I've got some some smaller barrels uh, on loan from One Eight Distilling in, in DC that their rye came out of. So uh, we've got that, and uh, one of the next barrels will be a twenty five gallon rye barrel. Um, I've got a barrel that uh, we used for barrel aging coffee beans with Chesapeake Bay Roasting Company. So um, I've got some rum in there. That'll be mm-hmm. one of the single barrels. Just kind of things that'll give a really unique expression to what we've done. We'll get uh, released under the single barrel. Uh, different fermentation techniques and that sort of thing as well. Um, And we do a coffee rum liqueur, which is our unaged rum. Uh, We infuse that with vanilla beans and all-spice berries, um, so it's got an all-natural spice to it. And then uh, we make a cold brew coffee with beans from Chesapeake Bay Roasting Company and uh, sweeten it all up with a caramel syrup that we make in-house. Nice. So, And then the the flagship aged rum is the uh, Solera aged rum. Right, and so we will give that just a quick, um, a quick nose here. I'm gonna try and be uh, be responsible with my pores here, so that uh, <laughs> I'm not staggering out of here. Okay, and uh, I really do like the the single barrel projects. Uh, just kind of getting a little experimental with it. I'm really excited to taste that one eight rye barrel because their rye is very unique. Like yeah. it's. Like a lot of the time people are like, oh yeah, you couldn't identify that blind. It's like, yeah, I, I could, I could identify that in my sleep just by, mm-hmm. just by nosing it. So it's, that's going to be a really distinctive one. So I'm nosing the, um, the Solera here. Um, so was this, was this bottle your, um, like, was this your first, second, third yeah, so bottling? This, this is batch uh, number one. So basically okay. this is that blend of uh, our rum, uh, about two and a half years average in, in our rum with uh, the older Jamaican rum, which is six to eight years. Um, so this comes out to about four and a half years in the bottle. It was the initial blend, and then we gave it another six months to mellow out in the in the barrel together. Right, and this is very different on the nose from from what we've what we've tasted and, and smelled so far. Um, it's it's a lot. I'd say the nose is a little bit a little bit more subdued than than some of the other stuff, and I think you know that comes from 
like having that time in the barrel to kind of chill out and and uh, an age. All right, now I'm gonna give a, a little a little uh, taste here and a slightly different mouthfeel too. I would say um, with your rums, you know, what do you what do you think really contributes to the mouthfeel? Because this is very very rich mm-hmm. and interestingly, like usually when I get a, a rich mouthfeel like this, I don't get a, a, a salivary response as intense. But this is both rich and kind of triggering the salivary response too. So, do you have any thoughts on like mouthfeel? So um, the big difference between this and what we just tasted in the dark rum is going to be there's no added sugar to to this, so no caramelized sugar or anything. So this is just pure rum out of the barrels. Um, and in in terms of what would be contributing that that rich mouthfeel, I'm not not entirely sure. It's kind of the beauty of the blend, right? Yeah. So I think the new oak probably plays into that. So again, our our rum that's in this bottle uh, was done in in new new oak. Um, the Jamaican rum was done in used oak, so kind of getting that that combination of those two. You get a lot of complexity from that. It's interesting. The, the Jamaican rum that goes into this, uh, I've never tasted a Jamaican rum like it. So um, it's very different from that kind of stewed pineapples and bananas that you're usually getting from a Jamaican rum, which is why we kind of liked it. It was, it was sort of surprising. It's, it's mm-hmm. a little... The, the fruity flavor profile of it is very different than, than your traditional Jamaican rum. Yeah, you get more of the almost like traditional Speyside flavors here, like the um, like the the Oloroso sherry finished flavors in there, like the like the stewed plums or prunes or whatever, um, and then like almost like that that dark raisiny fruit cake yeah. on it, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Yeah, and I get I get a lot of uh, spices in the in the slurry rum as well, the mm-hmm. allspice and cloves and and that sort of thing really come through in there. Totally, yeah, and I I get a little bit of salinity too, like mm-hmm. on the finish. I'm like it's uh, as as the finish kind of fades off, I get more and more almost like I'm like uh, that. F- I keep coming back to fruit cake because I'm getting a little bit of saltiness in there. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really, really phenomenal. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a a quick pause as we pour these things out. So you don't have to listen to 30 seconds of pouring, (laughs) and then we're going to come back and we're going to start tasting through these poles from the Solera. And we're back. So we're about to embark upon a vertical tasting in both of the literal senses, right? (laughs) So we are starting from the very top of this Solera. Uh, the level that is marked four, um, and then we're going all the way down to level zero, which is uh, the barrels that you actually pull out of when you're bottling this. Right. So why don't you take me uh, through this first uh, kind of top level uh, pull from the Solera? Yeah, so um, one of the sort of drawbacks about what we're doing right now uh, is I've pulled from a single barrel in each level. So each each of these barrels is going to be very different, especially in the top level where uh, which is where we have kind of the very different barrels. So the, uh, the port barrels, the, the red wine barrels, uh, used oak and, and new oak in the top level. Uh, so what I pulled from here is a relatively new barrel. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, it's been in there. Uh, it's, it's after our first bottling. So this is already a blend of things that have been aged previously and then our brand new rum going in there and then some additional age on that. Um, so one thing that we are doing with the the Solera for our uh, we try to make each of our products be be very different. Um, so e- even though it's all rum and it's all under the same brand, we want each of them to have some some different surprises to them. So the Solera, I've got uh, two different fermenta- fermentations uh, that we do. One is with our our yeast that we use for all of our other products, uh, which is that yeast isolated from natural sugarcane fermentations that we get from one of the major yeast suppliers. And then uh, we've also got a house strain of yeast um, that's from a completely different yeast species that you find in a lot of the Caribbean, uh, wild Caribbean rum fermentations. So um, this, our, our regular fermentation takes about six days to complete, which is still fairly long for a distillery. Most distilleries are fermenting in two or three days. 
for the big production distilleries. Um, so when we give it a little, we slow it down a little, give it a little more time to get more of those fruity flavors and stuff out of it, a little more complexity, some interaction from bacteria uh, that might get in there over that time. This other strain of yeast uh, takes three to four weeks to complete its fermentation. Oh, wow. And we're doing uh, open fermentation, so that gives plenty of time for things to get a little weird in there. Um, <laughs> and uh, and that's what's happening in a lot of those uh, Caribbean rum fermentations are are a lot more complex, a combination of, of, um, you know, the beer yeast or bread yeast that we're all used to, um, with different species of yeast as well as bacteria and stuff, creating all those crazy fruity ester profiles that, that come out of some of those high ester rums. Exactly. Uh, and, and if anyone wants a really good kind of crash course on yeast, go back to our interview or it was actually on the tour that we did with Brian Davis over at Lost Spirits Distilling in LA. Uh, he had a great, great metaphor for just like how, ye- like how esters occur and why, uh, yeast operate the way they do. Um, so if, if you're interested, go back and check out that episode. Um, but yeah, yeah. So we've got this, so this is a combination of, of new make spirit from the regular yeast and that super Mm -hmm. long fermentation yeast. And you said bacteria, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because then you put this through a still Mm -hmm. and, and, and it all like all the bad stuff goes away, but the flavor stays, right? So so basically the way those fruity flavors come into being, uh, they start out as acids. So, um, that that happens. Uh, some organic acids get created by the yeast, and those turn into um, esters when they combine with alcohol. Uh, and then you can really ramp that up with acid-producing bacteria. Totally. So some uh, when you do open fermentations, um, you're a lot more likely to get some of the bacteria in there, and then that's all going to get boiled in the still. And uh, within that that steam that's coming off the still those those acids are combining with with alcohol and creating esters which we perceive as fruity flavors right and And that's why uh, sourness is such an interesting uh, evolutionary flavor for us because when you say oh like like perfect example oh the milk went sour means the milk went bad Mm -hmm. right so sourness we can in some instances identify it as a as a flaw and yet because you know whether or not you believe in the drunken monkey hypothesis like yeah when when things ferment they also turn into to booze and, mm-hmm. and we like that too so <laughs> the presence of acidity is like this very kind of back and forth thing in evolutionary human flavor perception um so let's taste this we've been we've been swirling around here mm-hmm. for a couple minutes it's uh really well integrated on the nose this is like a very uh what, uh, with the barrel for this, was it a specific, t- is it new oak? Uh, new it, chard? It is relatively new oak. So, uh, it started out as, as one of those new oak barrels. Um, this is the second round of the, of pulling from the Solera. So it's, right. um, it's not still brand new, but it, you know, it's been, it's been used only for rum and it's been used for probably th- three years so far. Right. And so it's still got, still got plenty to, to offer in terms of that, that charred oak, mm-hmm. which you definitely get. And one interesting thing to me about this particular sample is that it went immediately to the back of my palate and like kind of, I, I feel it in, in like in the, in the, I guess that's the only way I can describe it. It's the back of my palate, the back of my tongue, the top of the roof of my mouth in the back. And you do get those tropical flavors. You get some of that pineapple in there. Uh, but it, it's, it's interesting to me that this went so quickly to the back. And I think maybe that has to do with um, some of the tannins in the oak and that, that, that want to dry you mm, out a little bit. Yeah. Mm. You get that distinctly charred nose. And do we know, you, you wrote in the bottles that this is all coming out at 46%. Yeah, so I proofed all these down uh, yesterday to the same proof that we bottle our, our okay. regular Solera at for comparison's sake. So right. with it, inside of the barrels, um, generally I, I bring things to about 100, 120 proof, uh, 60% each time that we bottle, uh, kind of reset everything. But in here we, we seem to gain about uh, a proof point per year. Um, based on the the fact that I guess more water is evaporating from the barrels than, than alcohol right. given our climate. Uh, so it's kind of a little bit of a struggle to keep it down to a, <laughs> a right. reasonable uh, 
um, percentage of alcohol in there. Exactly, exactly. So um, we've got through the first mark here. We are rinsing out our little uh, Glencairn glasses. Although I guess we do have the other. Oh, that's true. Here as well. oh, never mind. We don't need to do that. <laughs> okay, perfect. So we've got these so in. Next up, the 300 level is what we're looking at. Yep. Oh, so, wow. What a difference. That's crazy. Yeah. So in, in theory, each of these, each of these levels should, should end up about an average of a year older. Um, it doesn't exactly work out like that, but, um, in, in concept, it's something like that. Right. Sure. At least it's a, it's, it's incremental. It's, it's an even increment if it's not an even like year. Mm -hmm. And, but each level, just like the level that we're, that we're bottling out of is made up of older rums down to much younger rums. Right. So this I'm getting, as opposed to that, like heavy oak influence, I'm getting just a, it seems much lighter on the nose to me. It's, it's got like a, a youth to it that almost reminds me more of a white rum mm -hmm. uh, on the nose, but it's still obviously got a much more distinct vanilla characteristic on the nose, which to me, like when I think vanilla on the nose as opposed to caramel for a rum, I, I think age. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I get caramel, you can get caramel from, from anywhere, kind of. Yeah, especially with rum, there being very, very few rules about it. You have to make it out of sugar cane and you have to distill it to less than vodka purity. After that, you can add stuff back to it. Mm -hmm. um, so you, I pulled some rums off the shelf and I mean, all you have to do is call it rum. It's not necessary to call it spiced rum if you're including spices in mm -hmm. there. So I, I pulled a rum off the shelf, poured it in the glass. I'm like, there's no way there are that many orange and vanilla flavors in there. You're literally putting orange and vanilla flavors into this rum and not yeah. calling it spiced rum. Right, right. Uh, all right, so on the nose, mm. and very soft on the palate. Very different from the last one, which went like straight to the back, straight with those those kind of tannins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, the other one kind of coated the back of the tongue and really um, almost almost fizzed. Yeah, <laughs> in yeah, terms no, of the perception. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Mm -hmm. You got like. Um, yeah, like a fizzy, almost uh, there. Were, there was like a three dimensional, a three dimensionality to that mouthfeel um, that I think we is largely due to those those, those barrels. And this, it's it's much more polished, I think. Uh, and it, I was not expect. I'll be honest. Like when I saw like five of these lined up, I was like, are are we even going to be able to pull out that many differences? Especially with, I guess, a relatively short time that this has been in in effect relative to like how old the Solera right. could be. Yeah. Uh, I was actually skeptical, but that's a very large leap from, from one to two or from, I guess, four to three. Yeah. And I, I think we'll get another large leap between this and the next one uh, where things get a little funkier in our fermentation style. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm still, again, I'm getting um, like, I think with the, the first bottling of this Solera where I got that kind of like salted fruit cake type thing going on. Or was that with the was the, the regular aged? Um, I think we were talking about the Solera with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, th I kind of get that little bit of that salted, even though, you know, like it's it's funny. When a lot of people say like salinity, you're talking almost exclusively like an Isla Scotch or an Orkney Scotch or a Manzanilla Sherry where it's very explicitly aged by the sea or like Jefferson's ocean where it's put on a boat and mm -hmm. explicitly done. And I think this is a different type of salinity. I think it's, uh, I don't think it's necessarily saline at all. I just think that our, our taste receptors, um, are, are kind of tricking themselves into tasting something a little bit kind of salty here. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is different than something that you would come across in like a, a Lafroy. You know, so it's, I, I, I draw a very uh, distinct um, line between something like that and then something like this rum. And, and I do come across it in rum, I would say, more than other stuff. Hmm. So we'll move on to level number two, two, which is the third one down. Yeah, when I set this up after the fact, I was just kind of kicking myself. I'm like, why didn't I reverse the <laughs> reverse the numbers? Is it it just, uh, well, I guess it does go vertical. So yeah, it's the like the highest it's, it, number at the top. Exactly. It's like an <laughs> elevator and you get off at the ground level. So I, I think, I think it works. Uh, wow. Another big leap. And I'm getting 
like right away, some pepperiness on the nose. Mm-hmm. A little bit of leafy green, almost like a, not quite at menthol, not even quite to eucalyptus, but almost like a, a black tea on the nose. Maybe, maybe a bergamot. That might be a little bit of a stretch. Hmm. <laughs> That's something that I could I could smell for a long, long time. The pepper makes you want to take it away from your nose a little bit. But then as you get to like the, the finish of the nose, you get like this this intriguing dark fruit that makes me want to bring it back. So I'm kind of like going back and forth from my nose. And on the palate, incredibly smooth. Like way smooth. <laughs> We got two levels to go. Yeah. <laughs> Smooth, very vanilla, very, um, I'm getting some cola notes here. Um, a little like, like, vi- like moving toward molasses, but not quite molasses. So I'd, I'd kind of stop at cola. Um, yeah, this is nice. So uh, is there anything special about the barrels used in this level? Yeah. So, um, well, you can see the one on there. We've got, uh, the oh, one, eight the logo. One eight, yeah, yeah. So I've got, uh, a fun barrel exchange going on with them. Um, if they, they're very generous with the, the barrels that they've been emptying for their untitled, uh, whiskey series. Um, so I've, I've picked up a number of barrels from them uh, and filled them with rum. They don't have any requirements about when they get them back. So, uh, when I empty it, I'll take it back there. They'll finish their rye whiskey or, or one of their other products, um, with rum. And so it's, that's a very nice, very nice barrel exchange. Uh, the barrels that I am getting from them are quite old. So, I mean, some of those untitled whiskeys that they're doing are, are up over 10 years of, of like a wheat, weeded bourbon and, and that sort of thing. So the, the barrels fairly neutral compared to some of the, uh, the newer barrels that we have going on in here. Right. Fairly neutral, but it also has the influence of what was of in it whiskey, before, yeah. so right? So some of that. 10, 11 year whiskey. Out of yeah, well. exactly. And I, I liked it. Like this has the Although most. Although if the barrel shows up wet, I'm, I'm not leaving that whiskey in there to, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to mingle with our rum. So yeah. the rum's got to work to pull it out of the oak itself. There you go. There you go. That's, that's <laughs> completely fair. Yeah. This has, I would say the most similarity out of anything that we've tasted to a really nice bourbon. I'm trying to think it, it almost kind of reminds me of like some of the the whistle pig um old world series Mm -hmm. um and i know that one eight does some does some stuff with like uh like some some really interesting barrel finishes but yeah this is really refined and i think just being at the third level out of five right now and, and getting something with this sort of refinement is really indicative of of what value a solera can give because you know, the the question, right, the big hanging question is, especially for you, because you're the guy who has to operate the forklift and, and, <laughs> and empty out all the barrels, is like, why are you doing this? And I think it's becoming clear, like, even in such a short period of time, like, what value this gives, and which is really yeah. cool, which is why I wanted to do this episode. And for a small producer, I, I think the value is really there. You know, when, when one of the big bourbon distilleries, if you go and buy their, you know, like an Elijah Craig small batch or, a, you know, one of those small batches from a large producer, when they say small batch, they they mean less than, fewer than 300 barrels that they're blending together to sure. create that, that small batch spirit. Uh, for us, if we do small batch, it's a barrel yeah. uh, <laughs> that we empty. So um, our dark rum, we might be blending together two or three barrels. So we get some ability to choose flavor characteristics and get consistency from batch to batch. The Solera really allows us to to pull together 25 barrels um, and, and integrate them all into each batch, which gives us complexity that we wouldn't be able to get otherwise. And then through the nature of the system, we also get consistency as well. Right. And consistency is the most challenging thing as a small producer. Uh, we're using, in general, different types of stills than the big guys are using, right. uh, which are continuous column stills that have their advantages in throughput, um, but at disadvantages um, in the kind of flavors that they're, that they're able to create. So we can create more interesting flavors in the pot stills that we have. Disadvantages, we have batches. So there's inconsistency from batch to batch. And right. So this is a great way um, for a small producer like us to, to get consistency and complexity from batch to batch. Now, do you know of any other like Solera's operating in the U.S. right now? I, I imagine it's probably not like 
that foreign of an idea since it's been done for centuries with yeah, it's not it's not a foreign idea. Um, the The trouble is that there's no legal definition to it, like most things with rum. So when someone puts that on the bottle, what does it mean? What does it mean to them? Um, so there there are a lot of places that that kind of take that single that, that most simple Solera method, you know, of a single barrel that I was talking about. Maybe that barrel is a thousand gallons, and it's a big a big. Uh, what, big vat, yeah, yeah, big, like big, big wood, a wood vat, wood vat, or even a stainless vat. You could still slap Solera on the label with that. Yeah, it's more of like an infinity bottle at that point. <laughs> right. uh, but yeah, so so I know I know there's uh, when we set this up. Uh, from what I could track down, there was one guy uh, doing a Solera aged spice drum in Florida. Um, so that was three levels uh, of barrels. I'm pretty sure that we're the only. Um, just straight up age drum uh, with this kind of complexity of, of Solera in the U.S., at, at least when we set it up. That totally. may have changed a lot over the last couple of years. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, you know, obviously this is something that you're trying to offer to be unique and to, to be creative and push the boundaries. Uh, but I, I think based on what you're explaining, like what are two things that a lot of craft distillers struggle with? One is consistency mm-hmm. and the other is like the ability to create unique flavor profiles. And this is something that the that the Solera allows you to do really well on both ends. And so I think it's a great way, once you're producing enough juice now, like if you're still at the point where you start your distillery and you're, you're like a year in and you've still got stuff in barrels, like, all right, well, you got to wait a little bit before you start your Solera. Um, but for somebody who's gotten their operation off the ground and is struggling to figure out a way to add further value to their customers, I think this is a really smart way to uh, to do that. And and just I, I'm I'm blown away by the differences in these spirits. So why don't we um, move on to the fourth level, level one? All right. So now, so what what I feel like we just did is we went from very rum to very oaky, like in the direction of bourbon, to very refined bourbon, and now we're getting back in the fourth nose here to like very. This is very distinctly rum. Like mm-hmm. this is a rum drinker's rum. Yep. And as as we do move down the the stack here, um, we get higher in the proportion of of the Jamaican rum that we're bringing in. So that older, older Jamaican rum. Um, this right now is sort of, a sort of an an in-between level. Um, the oldest rums that we had of our own back in the beginning, uh, were fermented and distilled to be released young. So Mm -hmm. they were very clean. Um, I didn't, uh, in, in comparison to what I'm putting into the top of the stack now, they were, they were drinkable when they came out of the still, right. uh, which is one of the fun things about rum. Uh, you don't have to age it, you know, mm-hmm. white rum is a thing, uh, white whiskey, not so much of a thing, you know, right. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> People try to make it a thing, but it, it can be a thing. It can, it can certainly be a thing, but white rum, I've, I've always liked white rum, right. like not, not the stuff you get off the, you know the the discount liquor shelves but uh, like when i first tasted craft white rum i was like this is my jam yeah immediately <laughs> so you can you can ferment and distill rum uh, to be be drunk uh, right away you can ferment and distill it for it to take years to come around in a barrel so the stuff that i'm putting in the top now is i'm taking a much wider cut a uh, much deeper cut into the into the late fraction of the of the distillation um, I'll, I'll take more of the earlier side of it too. So we get more of those kind of headsy flavors in there. Mm-hmm. Those are going to have a lot of time in the barrel to evaporate through the wood and leave behind some totally. of the more fruity esters that are, that are in there as well. Totally. And I get like a little bit on the finish. I, I get a little bit of those, um, not, not headsy. It's not headsy, but it's a little bit, um, mentholated. It's like slightly mentholated, mm-hmm. um, I think that's that's the the end result on here. It doesn't it doesn't seem headsy at all. The nose is extremely clean. Oh. And you do get a little bit more like you get I got like black pepper on the last one. This one I'm getting a little bit more white pepper. And you get that pimento. You get a little allspice on the nose. And then on the palate, it's I get like I made this uh, pineapple syrup recently with just the like uh, Florida crystals, so like like pretty like a like a very clean but also like fairly dark sugar. And then I let I I, co- I 
brought it up to temp, put a bunch of pineapple in it, and then got it to a point where all the sugar had dissolved and then left it on the stove overnight mm. and then heated it back up to boiling in the morning. And that's kind of like very similar to what I'm getting on the palate here is that like really it's, it's got, it's pineapple-y, but it's also got like a, a richness to it that is really, really nice. Wow. That's cool. <laughs> so you've got so, such a great vocabulary for all the all the flavors and everything that are in there. It's um, well, it's, it's one of the most fun things about about tasting and, and yeah. evaluating is just coming up with those moments in your life that it connects to. Oh, totally. <laughs> and and we should do like at some point we should do this with people. Let's get in. <laughs> let's do a let's do a like a Solera class where we. Yeah, do this that's and, actually um, that, that is something I wanted to say. Now that we've got our our tavern open, we are doing. Um, you know, special events and tastings, especially on the on the weekends that uh, I'm working at the tavern. So, I think uh, May 18th, um, we're gonna get it together and put it on our, our website. But we'll do kind of repeat this um, for anyone that wants to join. Um, so there'll be a, a ticket price, uh, but then we'll we'll run through the the levels of the Solera and compare it to the final product. Totally, yeah, no, and I think people will get into that. We've been doing uh, a number of events like that with folks like Tenth Ward and Frederick, and people have been super super receptive to that and i think it this is a really unique thing that you have to offer so um definitely those classes are, are something that, that i think will sell really well um but let's get to this last taste yep so this is the this is the level that we will be bottling out of so in the next couple months uh, we'll be pulling the bottles and you get that this. jamaica and so the so what's interesting is that this is like the one thing that is actually going to like noticeably phase out yeah as you do the next two to three successive bottlings is like, so just to summarize for folks, basically what was done was you, you seeded these barrels with a little bit of, of rum from Jamaica. You said it was this fairly unique expression of Jamaican rum. And so like the cool thing is that that influence is going to decline pretty drastically with the next couple bottlings because what's going in is exclusively Blackwater's rum. Mm -hmm. And there's no more Jamaican being added to it. That was just right. to kind of get it kicked off. It was almost like a starter. Yep. And so that's what's going to be kind of going away. So this is where we're kind of tasting like the last of the dinosaurs here. There are no more of these. <laughs> They're going to be coming around. Yeah, so each each bottling of this is is totally unique. Um, you know, I, I talk about consistency with it, but for for at least the, the next several bottlings, this will be one of the one of the more inconsistent products that we have. But yeah. I don't think that's a, a bad thing. I, I think it's just you get to see how each bottling is totally unique. Yeah, and I think that's something that uh, people have un unreasonably or unfairly been marketed to not appreciate. I think uh, if there's one thing that I fight for uh, when talking to people, it, it is inconsistency and it is the, the appreciation of the batch and what is unique about that. And I think that's something that craft has to offer that people don't really appreciate. Yeah, it's got its it's got its upsides and its downsides. Um, so we try to make most of our products completely consistent. Uh, they they do improve as I learn new things and, and uh, figure out how to optimize the fermentations and that sort of thing. So you will still find some spectrum um but we do our new packaging that we have we we actually get a batch number on each bottle um so you're able to tie it back to right to uh to what we've been doing this is quite quite good it's funny i know that this is not a this th this particular bottom level has way less to do with the other levels above it. And yet I'm still pulling out some of those characteristics from that. So I think, I think, and, and this stuff went through those barrels that was on top of it, right? Well, we've only operated this, um, one time so far. Got so it. basically this has some of the level above it at okay. this point. Um, Understood. And then the next time we do it, uh, it will have two levels integrated. Into gotcha. It. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So this is, and so when, when we did start this out, there is Jamaican rum, um, all the way up to the top level. Uh, in the top level, it's like 10% of what's in there. Right. Uh, in the bottom level, it was in the beginning close to 50%. The level above it was more like 70, 30, our rum, Jamaican rum, mm -hmm. and, and it kind of decreased as you went up. Got it, got so it. So the it's not surprising that you're finding consistency um, among the, the levels in, in that sense. Right, and this is, it definitely has a Jamaican fingerprint to it, uh, especially on the nose, I find, but this is just a, a delight to drink. 
Um, and, you know, I'm usually thinking about this, you know, from the cocktail perspective, right? Thinking about, you know, the, the, just how delicious this, this white rum would be in a mojito is, is fantastic to me, but this, it just seems to want to be drunk on its own. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's something about Solera aged stuff that I think is really nice. Uh, I think, you know, when you, you get a really nice sherry pulled out of a really well-maintained Solera, it's a really special thing. Mm -hmm. And like, could you put that in an Adonis cocktail or a bamboo cocktail? Yeah, you could. <laughs> but there's a reason why it's got like a, a pretty hefty price on the bottle. And it's it's because, you know, sometimes these things, you know, the, the, the care that obviously you're describing, like throughout this whole process, you're thinking so hard about what you're going to do what, all the way from fermentation through the setup of the Solera. Um, and so I, I really think that this, as I smell and taste it, is just like, I really don't want to put this in a cocktail. <laughs> I mean, how do you think about it? Yeah. Um, I used to be really into, you know, making cocktails at home and coming up with new ways to use our spirits and everything when all we had was unaged spirits. Yeah. And now that we're getting into stuff that just goes so well by itself in a glass in the Glencairn glass, oh. that's generally the way I drink most, <laughs> do most of my drinking these days. It is. You know, a, a, a simple cocktail. I like to make, you know, rum old fashions. It's a, it's sure. a very simple drink. Um, just uh, bitters and, and sugar, really. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, th this would be great in an old fashioned. I think that, I think the, the level three and the level two would make really cool side by side old fashions. Cause you've got that pretty oaky one and then mm -hmm. you've got more of that like really refined kind of smooth sipper. And it's interesting that these are all the same proof. And yet you get like very different heat expressions in terms of the yeah. alcohol burn throughout. And so it's a really, it, it really challenges what you think you know about alcohol and proof and how like proof directly exerts its influence, like in, in terms of the hotness. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, really interesting. It's something I've been thinking more and more about as I learn more about it. But I think what this teaches is just like, nah, you don't, you don't know anything. <laughs> um, well, thank you for, for taking us through this really compelling tasting. Uh, I'm very, very interested to see how this, how it continues to evolve as, as you're able to kind of play with it more and refine it more, kind of work in maybe some more interesting barrels. I know mm -hmm. you're talking about, you've got some with wine finishes, you've got some with, you know, some, some different types of finishes. Um, but uh, I think this was really illustrative of the value that a Solera can bring. Um, did you want to, um, make any other kind of points or takeaways for our audience before we move on to lightning round? Um, I, well, not specifically related, related to the Solera, but, um, we did just open our new tavern. Um, so I just kind of poo pooed cocktails, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've got, uh, got our brand new tavern, uh, which is, um, uh, also located in Stevensville, uh, about a mile from the current, uh, the old facility where we're sitting right now. Um, but we've got 13 taps devoted to Maryland beers. Uh, we've got, uh, wines and food and everything. Um, and we can finally showcase our spirits and cocktails. So right. got a, a, a little cocktail list of, of pretty classic cocktails. Um, we've got a, a few more creative uh, cocktails on draft, which is fun. Yeah, um, we were talking about those. What are you what are you putting through those drafts? <laughs> so we've got a, a clarified daiquiri. So you, you taste just like a regular daiquiri, but it's crystal clear. Um, we've got a, a clarified rum punch uh, that's clarified with milk, which I know is a topic of one of your uh, recent episodes. It is indeed. Um, and we've got a uh, it's called a spiked hibiscus tea, um, mm. which is hibiscus tea with uh, a bunch of different spices and and, oh. and things like that. Yeah, um, that sounds fantastic. Clarified orange juice and our vodka, and then we've got a uh, a nitro white Russian. That's so. That is something that is very interesting to me, especially because you were telling me about the price. What, what is the price range for these cocktails? So, uh, for our draft cocktails, it's 10 to $11. Um, and then we've got, uh, we've got a, a menu of, of mules or stormies or whatever you want to call it. We make our own ginger beer. Right. Um, so we do a fresh ginger syrup, uh, that we combine with, with soda water from the gun. Um, and those are, are like eight seven, to eleven, seven to nine dollars yeah, seven, for those, yeah. I, I believe. Yeah, and which is which is absurd coming <laughs> from somebody who lives in D.C. Like you can't you can't get something <laughs> for that price unless it's happy hour and the thing happens to be a beer. 
Yep. And you're describing something that is on draft, which is a fantastic way to serve a cocktail because you don't have to wait. <laughs> like it's pre-mixed. You've done, you've done the dilution. You've done, you, you've, you've done all the things that a bartender is going to do to this cocktail and it's available immediately. You're using clarified juices and, and clar like clarified entire cocktails, which is something that you're only ever going to get at a really high-end cocktail bar where right. they're going to be charging you 15 to $20 for that same drink. And yet here we are on Kent Island, which is a big kind of like tourist area here in the Chesapeake. And you've got access to these really refined cocktails using really great products for a really like <laughs> stupid low price. So to me, like I'm, I'm kind of like trying to figure out like how much an Uber costs out right. here so I can like come and enjoy that happy hour at some point. But, um, well, at the very least, if you're on the way down to the beach this summer, definitely uh, stop in either on the way there or the way back. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think I, I really do appreciate what you're offering to, to this area. Cause it, it really is. It's super convenient to DC, super convenient to Baltimore and to the Eastern shore. Where it's, which is a, a really big tourist destination here in Maryland. So um, for those of you listening, definitely make a note to yourself. Try and stop off at Blackwater. At the, is, is the tavern just called Blackwater? Yeah, it's uh, Blackwater Distilling Tavern. Okay. Um, so you can find us at blackwaterdistilling.com. Uh, mm -hmm. Find all about it there. Um, Instagram at Blackwater Distilling and Twitter, Blackwater TM. Don't confuse us with the Blackwater Distillery in Waterford, Ireland. Uh, <laughs> bastards. And then uh, Facebook, uh, Blackwater Distilling as well. Nice, yeah. nice. <laughs> good, good. All right, uh, lightning round. Uh, what's your favorite cocktail? If you don't have a favorite cocktail of all time, uh, what's something you've been most recently obsessed with? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's there's stuff I make all the time and there's, there's my favorite cocktail that, that is just... It's fairly rare because it's it's kind of an expensive cocktail to make, but I love the last word. Um, it's it's just it's perfect. It's fresh and it's herbal and it's it's everything all at once. It is also my favorite cocktail. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. I do um, not. Yeah, it is perfect in 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 many senses. It is a perfect ratio cocktail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So but, yeah, you don't have to remember a lot either, except the ingredients. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I won't go into my normal last word rant here, but uh, long time listeners will know it, and uh, short time listeners can go back and find it. Um, if you were a cocktail ingredient, what would you be? Yeah, probably um, Campari or another Amaro. Um, I'm generally pretty bitter. <laughs> it can take a little while to get used to. Uh, but uh, yeah, my wife has stuck around. She seems to she seems to keep coming back. There you go. Well, I would be a little bitter too if I had to unload and empty out all these barrels too. But it's <laughs> it's it's funny. It's uh, I think I, I think uh, some of that that bitterness and or stubbornness. I'd I'd call myself a I'd put myself in that category too. Um, but it's uh, I think I think the products actually benefit from it because it's <laughs> you're you're really you're really uh, you're you're here for the product. And I, I think that really shows. So, um, if you could have a cocktail with anyone in the world, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just paint us a picture. Yeah, this one, this one's tough. It's the um, widow maker. Cause there's an entire history of the world to contend with. Right. But, uh, yeah, I've been reading, uh, reading a bunch of Russian literature, uh, recently. So getting into Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and, and those very guys, cool. and those two are both very different. Um, and I'd have to pick both of them uh, okay. but, uh, to go back and, and be able to pick the minds of some of these authors that do such a great job of just explaining the human condition and making you explore it. What's, um, and, uh, I guess with, uh, Dostoevsky, I don't know. I might might just be drinking vodka. Probably. <laughs> With Tolstoy, though, probably a, a really nice sherry. Yeah, I would say. I, I I don't know too, too much about Tolstoy. What have you read most recently from both of those? Uh, I just finished uh, recently Brothers Karamazov from, from Dostoevsky mm -hmm. and uh, Anna Karenina from Tolstoy. Oh, great. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. So getting into more advicey kind of stuff, are there any books either about rum or about Soleras or about anything we've been talking about that, that were influential to you and uh, that you'd, you'd recommend to other folks out there? So a lot of my reading about spirits is really focused on the production end. Um, and it can be really tough to get your hands on stuff. There's there's a ton of just bad internet information out there, as, as you know, just from 
cocktails and <laughs> oh. whatever you find on whatever random recipe website. Yeah, just Google Google a cocktail, click five links, and you're going to get five recipes right. for it, which is, to, to me, it blows my mind. <laughs> because what, like... Yeah, and these are yeah, classics, too, that, right, they're, that have they're, a way to make them. Yeah, they're classics that, like, somebody at one point wrote down in a book and if you're using that as the the er old fashioned or the er negroni like you have to go back and like i I don't see how there's that much variation about like i just did i just featured like maybe one or two episodes ago the godfather cocktail and sometimes the ratio of whiskey to amaretto is one to one Mm -hmm. and sometimes it is 16 to (laughs) one that's unconscionable so okay sorry so bad internet information about books so Um, i've I've been able to track down some some good ones on the on the production side of things one that's been really valuable to me uh is called studies on rum uh, by a guy named uh, rafael arroyo and it's it's an old out of print book. It was, wasn't really a book. It was more a pamphlet that, you know, with spirits, unlike beer or wine, it's not legal to make them at home. So you don't right. have a lot of the consumer level information. Uh, the one place you can find stuff, uh, is with rum. So a lot of these, um, you know, the Caribbean countries that are, are known for rum, a lot of the research and stuff is government funded. So okay. especially if you speak some different language, you can track stuff down, but uh, studies on rum um, was published in 1945, I think, um, and it was published after about two decades of of like scientific research at at the uh, um, in Puerto Rico on okay. all aspects of yeast and and their effects on on rum, and so a lot of the improvements I've made to our fermentations and everything uh, over the past couple of years have have been due to that book because um, there's like I said so much anecdotal crap stuff on the internet and right. to be able to track down something that is really well researched and and uh, their actual experiments uh, <laughs> sure around all these things has been uh, incredible from a, a more just general rum knowledge um i read a book a couple of years ago and i know they recently updated it the uh um and a bottle of rum history mm-hmm. of, history of the new world in 10 or 12 cocktails i can't remember right basically goes through you know punch and grog and all these different iterations of of cocktails and and discusses both the history of the new world and the history of of rum and how it was being produced over over the course of the last couple centuries right so that that's definitely a good read if you're if you're looking for just a more basic um general intro to rum yeah I can't remember off the top of my head the author of that, but he's he's written a number of yeah, uh, Wayne books. Wayne Curtis. Wayne Curtis. Yep. There you go. There it is. Um, so we'll link to both of those if possible. If I can get a link to the pamphlet, I'm I'm, I'm sure it's the internet has something on it. So <laughs> I'll, I'll throw up some sort of link on the show notes page for both of those over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. Um, and all you have to do is search for this episode with Andy Keller of Blackwater Distilling. Put in the keyword Solera, and you'll pull it up. Um, so last question here, uh, any advice that you have to somebody who is, um, thinking about, thinking about rum? I mean, it could be Solera advice. I mean, maybe you don't want to give, I mean, you don't give out your secret sauce for the Solera, um, but, or, or maybe just advice to a consumer, um, who is intrigued by this sort of process and might either want to start searching out for bottles on the market or maybe doing a little infinity bottle of their own at home. <laughs> Any advice? Yeah. Um, I, I think in general rum is, is not a well, uh, understood and consumed uh, spirit category in the u.s so just start exploring most of the stuff doesn't make it here um yeah. you know the because it's what like five or six percent of the u.s spirits market um so a lot of the a lot of the good rum from the caribbean goes over to europe um so seek out independent bottlers is where you can find a lot of really really fun stuff um but to me rum is is really the most diverse style of uh, category of spirits um, because you get so much flexibility as a producer Mm -hmm. can kind of stink as a consumer walking in and you know the only word that has a legal definition on the label is rum yeah Uh, so there's there's a lot of marketing and just crap thrown at you but um yeah just start start exploring rum it it really is there's an incredible diversity of of flavor profiles and I'd, i'd say much more so than than whiskey even Yep. Gun to my head. If I had to pick a category that I'm most interested in right now, it would be rum. 
Um, I, I think it's got a lot of room to improve and to and to grow, especially in the U.S. market, as you mentioned. And the point that you make, like, just compare, like, think about bourbon for a moment. All right, is it straight bourbon? Is it uh, bottled and bond? Is it like all these different terms have these very legal yeah. classifications to it? And with rum, it's like so. So really, what the danger there is to to you as a consumer is like, I mean do I have a bottle of crap or do I have a bottle of something that's, that's decent or do I have a really great bottle? Yeah. And I mean, the internet has certainly held things out. So, I mean, one of the dirty secrets of rum is how much sugar is added back to it um, yeah. after distillation. But, uh, these, this is testable and people have, have done this. Um, so you can go online and, and search out the, the grams per liter of, of sugar content of, of, basically any rum in the world right. um, at, at this point. So uh, that's a great resource. It's, it's anywhere from zero grams per liter as, as you know, our straight age rums are. Uh, and the only country with a legal definition about that is Barbados. So mm-hmm. if you do find uh, you know anything from Mount Gay or Foursquare or any of the other Barbados distilleries, they're not allowed to put any sugar adulteration back. But uh, it goes up to you know eighty plus grams per liter Ooh. in some of these rums. That is so a lot. You're getting into liqueur territory there. Yep. So uh, you know that's that's just very basic information that can sort of uh, help you separate some things out. Uh, it's not that adding sugar is necessarily bad it's just you know you should be able to know these things right right there's there's a question of like when is something enhancing the flavor of a spirit and when is something covering up a potential flaw yep um and i think i just recently had an, uh, an interview with a, a a gentleman named adam Safir who's from the dc isla scotch society and he mentioned that one of the places that he goes to when you need to figure out like if there's caramel coloring added to a scotch whiskey is is uh, german websites right. so that's maybe a good little workaround <laughs> if you've got some questions about your rum maybe Maybe find it on a German website and uh, hit up Google Translate to see what the <laughs> ingredients are. Yep. And just uh, one one shout out for another Solera aged rum um, that is generally available. I think Bacardi picked up distribution rights uh, a couple years ago, so you'll actually see it on a lot of shelves. It's the Santa Teresa 1796 out of um, uh, is it Venezuela, I think. Okay. Um, so it's uh, just a really nice sipper, complex, and perfectly drinkable, neat. Cool. Beautiful. So we'll throw links to all that stuff in the show notes uh, over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. And uh, Andy, just um, throw out your website and your social media one more time for yep. us. It's uh, blackwaterdistilling.com um, on Instagram at Blackwater Distilling, Twitter at Blackwater TM, and Facebook at Blackwater Distilling. Beautiful. Andy, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Eric. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, beautiful Solera aged rum courtesy of Andy Keller and Blackwater Distilling Company, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2019.